Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jeff Zhang. I'm the director of the Ontario chapter for the Canada China Business Council, or CCBC. I would like to welcome you to this great online meeting. Today, we are very pleased to have three partners from ISM Canada to talk about the risk management in global operations. Our speakers will discuss the delicate balance between the risk profile and the pursuit of growth, ownership of risk management, and how COVID-19 have impacted the operating model. You will also learn more about cybersecurity concerns and how to protect the organization and the data. ISM's purpose is to deliver the power of being understood to the clients through world-class audit, tax, consulting services, focused on the middle market globally. The firm is the Canada member of ISM International, a global network of independent audit, tax, and consulting firms with more than 43,000 people in 120 countries. Today's session will be moderated by Mr. Grant Ray, the National Industrials Industry Leader and an Audit Partner at ISM Canada. We will also lead the China Practice Group for ISM Canada. Okay, without further ado, Mr. Lui, the screen is yours. Thank you, Jeff, um, uh, and, the, and the Canada China Business Council for having us join today's webcast to bring insights and ideas to your members. It is uh, an absolute pleasure to be here. Uh, we have been working with the CCBC for just over a year now, and we appreciate being able, uh, able to engage in the dialogue with you directly and learn about what moves you and your business. With China's uh, transitioning economy becoming increasingly service-led, and through projects such as the One Belt, One Road initiative, China offers significant enhanced trade and investment prospects. We recognize that organizations like yours want to tap into this potential, and we are here to meet, your, uh, to meet your needs. To that end, we have established a China practice group. This group is comprised of professionals who are bilingual, and we have been in lockstep with Canadian-based and Chinese-based companies to address uh, the organization's uh, uh, inbound and outbound needs. It is uh, now my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today. Catherine Gutt leads our risk advisory group, providing internal audit and risk management services to multinational entities. Most recently, she worked for one of Canada's largest banks as VP and global head of strategy, planning and operations for internal audit. Catherine has extensive experience with global regulators having served as in the chief audit executive role for a U.S. national bank. Ryan Duquette leads the security privacy risk consulting practice at RSM Canada. With over 20 years of experience within the investigations and cybersecurity field, Ryan focuses on litigation support, cyber incident response, privacy, and cyber technology risk, digital forensics, and cyber fraud matters. Previously, Ryan was a police officer focusing on cyber crime and fraud cases, and now brings his experience from multiple industries to RSM Canada's clients. So one more housekeeping item before we begin. We will have a Q&A at the end and encourage your questions. At the bottom of your screen, you can find a Q&A chat box. Please enter your questions there throughout the presentation. I look forward to this insightful discussion and to your questions at the end. I will now pass this along to Catherine, who will take us off. Thanks, Grant, and thanks, Jeff, for uh, having us today. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you on the call today, and, and thanks to the China, Canada China Business Council for hosting this event. Uh, the topic, as you've heard today, is risk management, and I can certainly say that we didn't know the extent of the changing times we would be living through right now. So we'll also be talking a little bit about how the current uh, COVID-19 situation plays into the risk uh, landscape for so many, and how it's a real example of the ability to uh, challenge our thinking around risk management. So we're going to start with a polling question, just so that I can get a gauge of, of who we have represented uh, with us in the group. So if we can have uh, that question pulled up. So 
so the question is in terms of the role in your organization. And really, you know, simplistically, if you're representing the first line of defense, uh, which is in the business generation side of things, second line of defense, which would be a risk management or control function, uh, third line of defense being internal audit or other, because there's uh, lots of other roles out there as well. So if you can just take a second and click through that, then we'll be able to make this as relevant to, to you as, as possible. We'll give you a couple of seconds to do that. All right, um, we can, at the right time, let's uh, see what that looks like. Okay, so we've got the majority of you are from the uh, first line, uh, which is the business generation profit oriented side of things, and then a few in the other. So that is uh, good information to know, and, and we'll keep that in mind as we're going through this. Thanks for doing that. So we'll try to make this as relevant uh, to you as possible then in terms of the things to think about from a first and uh, first line perspective. So uh, we're gonna, uh, you know, acknowledging that organizations represented today may be at different uh, levels of maturity on the risk governance uh, spectrum. We're gonna address uh, some common business issues and some common risks and, and some key uh, risk management principles um, we'll also look at the things to think about as you get to a desired uh, risk governance mitigation state. And this is not just about those oversight roles. This is about uh, ownership of risk management across the organization. And then, as I mentioned before, we'll also talk a little bit about uh, the impact of COVID-19. Uh, the discussion is meant to help you go from where you are today. This is not assuming that you're at a certain maturity model at this point. It's, uh, it's really taking where you are today and getting it to the next level as you operate in Canada uh, and abroad. So we're going to get into the discussion um, with a few business issues that might be facing uh, global organizations. I'm sure each of you can relate to a part of this. I'm going to focus on ones that are related to more of the first line operation side of things. Um, so just cutting across some of these examples, business management, a lot of this relates to the organizational construct. So it's a blend of business risk as well as people related risk. Um, it's about personal accountability. It's about individuals' personal views on risk and, and whether you're viewed as a risk taker or you might be risk averse depending on the role that you have, um, how you might be incented and how your colleagues might be incented and what behaviors that might uh, drive right from the top of the firm through to the staff. And it's certainly an area of focus for global organizations, especially those that are decentralized, because uh, the view is as, for, as far as the operations are out of sight, that may carry greater risk as it moves away from the center. And that center could be Canada in this case, or it could be uh, China in this case, whatever the case may be, um, the further the way you are for, uh, further away you are from the center is where um, uh, you know, risk management becomes even that much more important. Uh, again, given the group that we're talking about, we'll talk a little bit now about the sales and marketing and pricing. And so there's incentives here, and I think we've all been in discussions recently, even, it doesn't really matter what your business is, um, in terms of the sales effort and, and uh, incentive uh, practices, sales practices, uh, business generation practices, those sorts of things. And where does that transition from uh, generate the business to uh, manage the risk that we've now brought into the business? Uh, I think we've all experienced those and are we dealing with mature processes that resist influence or do we have to be concerned about where there might be potential to uh, influence uh, in, a, in a negative way. Uh, another area that's, that's uh, important right now and is taking um, you know, a different lens as we're heading through this pandemic is in the mergers and acquisition space. People's business models are changing and so by its very nature due diligence activities are um, are risk management activities. And so when you're in a situation potentially where you might be uh, acquiring or being acquired, what decisions has a firm made, an organization made that will come back in the future? Uh, so those are those longer tailed risk events to think about. And so keeping your eye on that horizon, just giving you examples of where risk can surface uh, when dealing with just regular business issues. And then the last one I'll highlight is uh, just given the group we have is the infrastructure and mobility side of things. And so this is a, a question of where do your risk managers currently sit? 
And this is not about, you know, it's only in second line or third line. I'm actually happy that we have mostly first line represented here because risk management does reside with first line. They're the, the individuals facing the, the world and basically deciding what comes into the organization and then how does that get managed uh, across risk governance practices. So those are the sort of just a cross section of issues um, that we might deal with from a business perspective. We'll now talk a little bit about some common risks. These can be external or internal. Uh, it's a combination of those. They're also controllable, less controllable or more controllable. And you'll think about it also in the sense of, you'll hear me talk about this a little bit, the tolerance for these risks can be different. So not all risks are equal. And how much um, focus an organization might put on trying to manage one risk versus another will depend on how much they can actually tolerate um, in the ongoing operations. So we'll just quickly go through these. Uh, reputational, of course, this is intuitive to all of us, um, but this is really what's changing right now is what the sources of those risks can be. Uh, with social media and the speed with which information is now disseminated, the speed with which special interest groups can now be mobilized, reputational risk has, has really changed in terms of where it can come from. It's no longer just about what gets printed in a newspaper. It can, it can come from all sorts of sources. Um, strategic, there's certainly lots of things that can impact the strategy of an organization. It could be financial, it could be um, market-focused uh, decisions, and, and again, some of this can be less controllable because it's really dependent on things like what's happening with the pandemic. We can't control what's happening there. All we can control is uh, how we might pivot uh, in a strategic response. Operational is a very big category of risk. It's really sourced from within the organization. It's connected to how people and processes and technology work together. Uh, for example, you know, are, are we well positioned for people leaving the organization? Are we, uh, uh, do we have a, an optimal organizational culture? Those sorts of things factor into operational. Uh, cybersecurity, you're going to hear a lot about uh, in a few minutes when, when my colleague Ryan presents, so I won't go into that. Um, information sharing, data security, privacy, all concerns as the, you know, prevalence and speed of uh, technology is, is something we're all experiencing. Places where data can now um, be accessed are different than they used to be. Some of them are visible, some of them are not. And so thinking about those things, um, certainly important. Third party risks is an interesting one. It's, uh, you know, people have always thought about third party risks as being the risk and, and there's a concept of connectivity of third parties to other service providers. And so there's really a fourth party risk to now think about um, where third parties might be subcontracting as well and then they may be subcontracting. And so how far does it go and really who are you dealing with as an organization? Regulatory oversight, I think we're all familiar with in terms of regulators, you know, that's not really controllable from an organizational perspective. It's really how we respond to what's changing and what's expected as regulation changes, as, as political environments change. And then, of course, there's um, legal. So always a risk of litigation. Uh, the interesting part here is it, it can often be quite long-tailed. So again, a decision today that generates litigation risk tomorrow. Uh, keeping your eye on those. So you can sort of see across the spectrum of these, um, there's really, uh, you know, a, a collection of controllable and less controllable risks. And so how an organization deals with that and copes with that is really what risk management is about. And so with that, we'll get into risk management, uh, just an overview. Again, most of you might be familiar with this, but just to, to level set, you know, lots of different, def different definitions of risk management. Uh, we're going to simplify it and just calling it dealing with the risks and opportunities that can affect an entity's value creation or preservation. And, and I would suggest that risk management is a process. It is not an end state. It is something that you iterate, uh, you know, over time. It's a constant iteration. It's a constant monitoring, and, and you'll see that as we talk about it. Um, You'll, yeah, you, you do have to think about the concept of mitigation to a tolerable level. So you heard me say that earlier. Um, you know, the intent is not to eliminate risk. That's an impossible feat. You would never make any money if you actually tried to eliminate all risk. And so operating in an environment where you can conclude what your tolerable risk is for all of those different types that we've talked about um, and, and where you can and operate in that space and still uh, you know, manage the safety and security of the organization, but still do what needs to get done and, and execute on the strategy of the organization. Uh, with that, a, a risk management framework needs to be selected. And so this requires lots of thought and input from key stakeholders, and you all being predominantly uh, from the first line of defense certainly have a view on that. You're right at the front line of being able to see where those risks might be coming from, 
uh, thinking about the exposures, what, you know, if the risk question is what could go wrong, uh, we later have to answer the question of what, what can we do about it. And so, again, operating in an environment where these are the realities of it. You, you can't change that you're operating in a, in a risk environment. Uh, so how do you make risk-informed decisions? That's really what the uh, framework helps you to do. Um, again, some being less controllable and more in deciding where where you can where you can operate, and then the geography. So when we're talking to a group that represents global organizations, I mean certainly geography impacts uh, how those risks look. Some may be more exacerbated because of the location and and others and and corporate culture and other regulatory impact that we need to think about. And so when you're operating a global organization. Um, it's even more important to understand the nuances of, of where your, your companies are operating and what could be influencing how those risks uh, surface in an organization. Once you've got a framework, you're really looking at what the controls need to be in place to mitigate that risk. So we've already thought about, well, what could go wrong? So now how much do we need to do to respond to that? And this is not about, you know, throwing out what you've already got. I mean, foundations of organizations, especially global organizations that might be as mature as the ones that you're representing today, um, certainly have a control framework that's already in place. And so what can you do to tweak it? What can you do to make it stronger? Where does something need to be completely redesigned and where does something need to be simply enhanced? And so thinking about that and, and who can help make those decisions um, is an important uh, part of, of of, of controlling in a risk-informed uh, way. Obviously, close monitoring by governance bodies, and so be that, and we'll talk a little bit in a minute about what those governance bodies can look like um, and, 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 you know, what the different um, spectrum of practices look like there. Um, the scale is important, you know, size of organization. You could be a smaller global organization, you could be a larger global organization. So scaling to achieve the strategy, still achieving what the business objectives are, like I said earlier, mitigating all risk to, to zero is not the answer that's going to get, um, you know, have, a, have be popular from a strategic perspective, but certainly, you know, still trying to deliver the optimal service and balancing the operations from a financial perspective, from a compliance perspective, and, and from an operational perspective is the objective. And the benefits, you know, somebody would say, well, well, why do I need to do this? Why don't I just deal with things as they come? Well, you know, surprises can be costly. And so, you know, limiting those costly surprises, having an eye on what may be coming, not necessarily having the answer to everything before it happens, but knowing how you might respond. So did everybody know how they would respond as an organization to the pandemic? Maybe not. Maybe it was theoretical. But many organizations were able to draw upon business continuity plans and other things that they had in place Maybe they hadn't had a chance to test them, but they were able to draw upon something that they had that they had in their back pocket. And so that helps boost the resilience, obviously, for the organization and helps to also then prioritize where we might put resources. You want to have your people focused on the biggest risk areas for the most impact. So with that, as I said, we'll talk a little bit about risk, what's your risk governance. You're, you know, again, you, you may find yourself in, in any of these bullets where you might have a centralized oversight structure. Um, the second point is an important one in terms of when does risk management and control move from being embedded in the executive ownership, so two or three people who might own it, to being embedded in the culture. And that's why, you know, I was happy to see that we've got first line people here because, you know, first line, it's important for people to understand that you're ultimately the first line of defense on risk management for the organization. Certainly there's risk management functions for lots of organizations um, that also have a role and then, uh, you know, internal audit functions functions that come into play as well. But not every organization has the luxury of having all of those lines clearly defined or the, or the scale to do that. And so really risk management mindset across an organization being embedded in the culture is ideal. Uh, the question of whether it's global centralization or decentralization, oftentimes first lines are decentralized and then the control functions are, are centralized. And so how those play against each other is an important question to answer. Uh, senior leadership team oversight, like I said, you know, it can be driven from the center or it needs to, to emanate through, throughout the organization. There needs to be ongoing measurement and monitoring. And the reason for that is because the risk profile of an organization changes all the time. And so it cannot be viewed as static. It needs to be thought about, uh, you know, re repeatedly to get to the right balance. Uh, internal control considerations, I won't spend too much time on this because we don't have control functions uh, represented on this in this group, but I think all of you would, would recognize the importance of having internal controls to respond to a risk management scenario. 
Um, and so there's lots of ways in which to do that, lots of levers to pull um, in terms of refining, like I said, existing processes, building new ones, but I won't spend a lot of time on the control side of things here. We can always talk about that at a, at a later point with your colleagues if, if, uh, if that becomes something of interest to you. In terms of where your entity fits, so you'll sort of see this diagram. There's a lot on here. We're going to very quickly go through it left to right. Um, you know, managing expectations. Um, it, it's really about, you know, risk management expectations are driven by lots of sources, not the least of which is, you know, the internal organization. You've got all the regulators and the overseers and clients and peer organizations all driving where an organization needs to be. If we just quickly go around the circle, uh, starting at the at 12 o'clock, you know, understanding what your risk, organization's risk philosophy is in the global scheme of things, knowing all the geographies, knowing all the players, knowing what, where you want to be. Um, event postmortems is always a good insight into risk management to think about what has gone wrong, let's say, in our, or, on, in our own organization, or what's gone wrong even in, in a peer organization, and could it happen here? And how would we respond if it happened here? And are we equipped to respond if it happened here? Um, independent reviews, obviously, those, you know, again, when there's an event, having an, an external come in, engaging specialists, having a, a specialized group within your own organization who has a lens that, that is risk-informed certainly helps to figure out where an organization could refine the risk management program going forward. Uh, we already talked a little bit about embedding risk and control principles. That's really into the culture of the organization. And the importance of developing a risk register. So this sounds like, you know, a, a theoretical exercise, but really the, the concept of going through uh, where could things go wrong and, and really having that candid discussion across an organization and, and think about it in terms of it's not, it's not um, unacceptable to have that discussion and sort of feel like, you know, you're exposing the organization because the natural um, tendency is to say, well, that could never happen here. Well, what you want to be in the position of saying is, we're going to make sure that that doesn't happen here, or we're going to put all the control in place to make sure that doesn't happen here. So it's setting aside, you know, the pride that we might have in our own organizations and say, well, could it happen here? And if it did, what would we do? And, and what are those risks that we want to have an eye on? Whether they happen here or not, you know, good for us if they don't. But sort of opening that uh, closet up to be able to say, okay, what are all the things we need to be concerned about? And then, of course, developing what the risk indicators are and how would you know if it's coming at you? What is the monitoring that you have in place to know that you are being, um, you know, exposed to a certain event or a certain risk? And then the proactive nature of this. So this is all about, you know, not asking uh, after an event has happened, not asking what now. This whole dialogue is about asking what if. And so if there's anything you take out of this discussion, um, it's, it's a question of the, the, the what if versus the what now and where on that spectrum do you as an organization want to be. And then the results obviously are risk informed decision making, um, being able to identify elevated areas of, of concern, having a measured response and certainly being able to deal with negative outcomes appropriately. So that's a big picture where we're at, um, you know, some high level concepts as to where you fit in. I'm going to fairly briefly now go into just a good example of where we've had to think about, um, you know, the impact of an event that, that maybe was not uh, well understood prior to the events of a few months ago. And starting from the center uh, on the COVID-19 impact, business continuity, of course, is at the forefront of everyone's mind. Um, this is the first time in some cases that people, processes, and systems have been tested in this way. And so what has this event done to the operational risk for an organization? And, and Ryan will talk a little bit about the cyber implications of that as well. Uh, moving to the top of this slide, there's obvious uncertainty as to the duration and the severity of this pandemic and how pervasive the uncertainty is going to be and what other individual risks are going to be impacted. If you take that example of third party risk, if you're being impacted as an organization by the pandemic, so are your suppliers, so are your clients. And so what's the additional third and fourth party risk that you're now taking because of the flow through effect to your organization? Uh, government and regulation globally is changing to respond in terms of what's going on in the world. So what does this mean to your systemic risk? Um, things that you can't control, things that are just coming at you and now uh, where you may have had programs and policies in place to deal with what your current uh, economic situation was, that's now changing daily as government and regulation is changing. Uh, again, looking at the end-to-end -end parties that are uh, involved in your supply chain and, and how the uh, pandemic might be impacting all of them. 
And then certainly the return to workforce. I mean, if you, uh, you know, as we go to that return to normal scenario, um, what is it going to look like? What's the behavioral impact? How are, how are your teams now impacted? And what does this mean for being able to retain key individuals that were part of your business model um, and succession planning? And then, of course, the cost considerations. You know, what are the financial risks of all that has happened um, in terms of client disruption, the cash flow uh, disruption, and then, of course, what does that look like from a reputational perspective? And so the, the final slide that I'm going to talk about is really around, you know, how you might try to link some of these things together and say, okay, and I'm not going to go through all of these. I'm just going to take one example. But these are some of the questions where the better you know your risk environment and the better you know your organization's ability to respond to it, and in your cases as first line, the better you are able to contribute to that, the, the better position you're in to answer some of these questions. Like, I'm going to take the third bullet under uncertainty, which is, what does innovation now look like? We have changes in the workplace. We have continued evolution of business models in the midst of this crisis. And so the, the, the better that you know your risk um, profile as an organization, the better you're going to be able to respond now to say, okay, what does business as usual actually look like? And where do I want to put my investment to still be a relevant organization and still make those innovative decisions and um, innovative um, you know, strides in industry so that we can stay competitive. Um, in the second one, the one I will take as an example of is the first bullet. How, how do we even manage against all of the daily updates? We are, we are being inundated with information constantly in the news, in, in, in you know, the sessions like this, in all of our daily discussions. What's real? What's additive? What's contradictory? And, and how, is, how is your organization keeping track of all of this and understanding what that does to the risk of the organization? Uh, we talked a little bit about the business model shock, and so I'll just focus on the last bullet in that one, which is, does my business continuity and disaster recovery plan need to be updated? So again, first time where we've had a real test of it, how much now needs to change going forward? Uh, in terms of the fourth column, the uh, productivity. So let's talk about that. Um, how do you best enable productivity for remote employees? Uh, again, I think uh, Ryan will talk a little bit about that from a tech perspective. But does the infrastructure even support the remote working model? And then when we return to work, are, what are the safety issues, the space issues? All of those sorts of things that now become a new way in which we have to look at the risks that our organization is operating in. And then finally, uh, how might we best scale down operations to position ourselves in order to rapidly scale back up? So a lot of organizations had to pivot, and you're, you may still be in organizations where you're pivoting to respond to what's going on in the world. Um, and so how do, we, how do we either sustain that or come out of that in such a way that you go back to really business as usual or potentially a refocused strategy um, that now responds to this new uh, world that uh, we're working through. And so I'm sure, you know, you and your organizations are already thinking about some of these questions. Uh, and so now I would just sort of challenge thinking about them more from a risk and control lens. And so rather than having one-time fixes, what is the go-forward solution that just puts your organization in a better position to deal with? This is just one example. We earlier went through a number of examples of risk. So how well positioned are you as an organization to be able to deal with that globally? And so that's, uh, like I said, a, you know, a quick uh, capture of um, risk management concepts with a bit of a real live example of how we're living through it today. Um, certainly appreciated the time to be able to spend with you on that. And, um, you know, with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Ryan, who's going to talk uh, a little bit about the uh, cyber security considerations. Perfect. Thank you, Catherine. Let me share my screen. Okay, excellent. Well, again, thank you everybody for uh, for inviting us out today. It's a, it's an absolute pleasure to be here, um, and we're going to go through some some cybersecurity considerations. Uh, so, you know, as Catherine talked about, you know, risk management, cybersecurity is obviously a a, a a small function of that. So, I want to start off a little bit by just going through a few statistics for you to sort of show you the cyber landscape and and what we are seeing on our side of things before we dive a little bit deeper. 
These are the types of cyber attacks that we dealt with last year as RSM as a whole, and not just in Canada, but we are part of a larger security and privacy risk practice for all of North America. So as you can see on this screen, the two major risks that we've been dealing with now for some time uh, are, are ransomware and, and business email compromise. And I'll sort of explain a little bit about what those two are. I'm sure most of you on the call have heard of ransomware where an attacker will come in and encrypt your entire environment and demand a ransom, uh, a payment in order to give you those decryption keys. Um, that, that attack has, has switched a little bit in the last few years. And what attackers are now doing is they are exfiltrating uh, a whole bunch of your data from your organization, um, also encrypting everything demanding the payment to, to give you the decryption key, but also uh, holding your, your data hostage um, as well. And uh, it's, it's a large concern for organizations right now. So some of the things we're gonna talk about today will, will help you mitigate that. And then business email compromise is obviously a, a large threat as well. And that's where an attacker is able to gain access into your business email system. And they can use that to, to launch various attacks to other places, or they can you know, be within your system and, and uh, launch attacks within your system. So um, from, a, from an industry perspective, you can see here on this slide that practically every type of industry falls victim to these types of attacks. Obviously some are a little bit higher than others and, and these stats um, shift uh, over years. Right now, uh, over the, you know, since, since COVID-19, we've seen a dramatic shift in, um, obviously healthcare has been a major target and also uh, a lot more professional services. But you can see on this slide that you know, healthcare, professional services, retail and financial services are the top four targets for most of these cyber attacks. And that seems to have been consistent for, uh, for some years. But, everybody is a target for uh, for various cyber attacks a lot of organizations uh think that you know we are too small um for for a cyber attack we, we don't have anything of value for a cyber attack and the stats actually show completely the opposite to that you can see on this slide and this is a study that's done by net diligence which is a a large organization that works with uh, insurance providers in relation to cyber insurance claims and uh, they put out a study every single year uh, that you can find online for free. And it's really a fascinating study because it dives deep into all these industries and the, the cost of a breach. And as you can see on this slide, the majority of the attacks are on small to medium enterprises and not large companies. Most large companies have more resources, uh, people or, or technology to invest in cybersecurity. And a lot of small to medium enterprises struggle a little bit with that. They might not have an in-house team to assist them with cybersecurity measures, or they might not have all the proper measures in place, and they are ripe targets for, for cyber attacks. Uh, so you can see 96% is, is, is small to medium enterprises. Um, one question we get asked all the time is how, as an organization, are we being targeted? And, uh, you know, and where do these attackers get this information to use to launch these attacks to get, get to us? Um, it, a lot of it is through social engineering. And as you can see on this slide, there's a variety of different social platforms I've put up on here, including your organization's website. I have RSMs here uh, just as an example. Attackers will, will look at all of these various platforms and they will gather all the information that they can about you or your organization before they launch an attack against you. Um, your, your education, your work history, contact information, whatever they can gather about, about you they will use that to launch what's called a phishing attack, which I'm sure most of us have, have seen. And the more that they can personalize that attack, the more that attack becomes, or at least appears to be legitimate. And, and the higher the chance that you will click on that, uh, that link or that attachment or follow the directions within that email if it's personalized. So the challenge becomes for organizations is looking at how much information we are not only putting out about our organization, but also about the individuals that work at that organization. So it's, it's a bit of a fine balance there that we have to, that we have to, you know, come to an agreement with, 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 you know, your employees and everything is be, be a little cautious about how much information we're giving, you know, our websites, you know, show us, you know, what services we offer and oftentimes an organizational chart. So they know who to, you know, email or whatnot. Uh, so we just have to be cognizant and we have to know what information is out there uh, about our organizations. Uh, 
um, you know, so we can, we can be aware of that. Um, defining cybersecurity. Uh, cybersecurity has gone through many definitions over the years. And, you know, it used to be information security and data security and now cybersecurity. In essence, it is all the same thing. I really like this definition because it incorporates three different factors. To me, uh, you know, this definition, a blend of technologies, processes, and practices designed to protect networks, devices, programs, and data from attack, damaged, or unauthorized access. You know, in other words, you know, keeping what matters uh, the most to you and your business protected. You know, simply put, making sure the right information is available to the right people at the right time. I really like this definition because a lot of people think that cybersecurity is only an IT issue. And in fact, it is not. Um, you know, and this definition incorporates um, processes, technologies, and practices, those three different factors, which is very, very important to look at all of these things in consideration. And Catherine was going through a lot of, you know, similar talk around, you know, just risk management in general with your processes and practices and, and whatnot. So I really like this definition. I want to go through a few facts um, about cybersecurity. Again, I mentioned that cybersecurity is not an IT issue. Uh, IT may be able to help, but normally it is not their role. Most IT and environments, their role is to uh, deal with operations of the company from a, from a technical standpoint and making sure that, that everything is, is running smoothly. And a lot of times security uh, of, of that infrastructure is not often their main role. Um, so, it, it, you know, cybersecurity is a business issue. It's not a technical issue. So we need to sort of take it away from, from just being a technical problem and think of this as a, as a larger scale problem. The cybersecurity landscape is, is very complex um, and there are competing drivers in, in this as well. Uh, there are principles of confidentiality, integrity, and, and availability. Uh, you know, remember on the, on the last slide where I talked about the, having the right time and information uh, for the right people, um, you know, those principles are bases of this. And we all need to make sure that there's this balance uh, between all these things because shifting uh, one way or the other can, can affect um, can affect those principles. Uh, the other fact is that, you know, business enhancing actions can lead to disruption. Rapid changes to meet your clients or your stakeholders needs or demands uh, or to involve in your business, which makes sense, absolutely, can cause some downstream effects and sometimes considerable. So it's something to consider that when you are enhancing your environment from a technical or process um, perspective, you might want to have, you know, cybersecurity in, in the back of your mind and, and think about how do these changes, how might they affect our security. And complex controls can, can hamper success. Over engineering controls uh, can, can sometimes be very restrictive. We see a lot of clients where they, they are involved in a, in a cyber incident, a breach or whatnot, and they go full uh, the other side where they over control their environment and it hampers their day-to-day -day, uh, operations and really slows them down. And as Catherine said earlier, you can't, you know, uh, you, you can't deal with every single risk in your environment. And we sort of see the same thing from a cyber perspective. We have clients ask us to, you know, make sure that every aspect of their business is secure from a cyber attack. And that can, can definitely be, be a little bit restrictive. So, you know, this all sounds great, but, but at the end of the day, what is it that we are trying to achieve? What, what is our cyber objective? So ultimately it is, you know, mature processes, methods, tools, and skills working in unison with a common goal. Um, and that goal is well-trained people following well-developed procedures using well-implemented technology. So it goes back again to those, those three various factors. Um, you know, ultimately we want to help people make informed decisions at the end of the day. This is a simple premise, but obviously a, a bit of a complex execution. So from a navigation perspective, you know, how do we as cybersecurity practitioners see this? Well, the first thing that organizations need to do is figure out what it is they need to protect. Like I just mentioned earlier, you can't protect everything that becomes uh, detrimental to your, your day-to-day -day operations. What is critical? or what must you protect due to any regulatory needs. So that is the first step. You need to identify your crown jewels. Then you have to develop controls, uh, both detective and preventative, um, to protect those assets. And these can be procedural or technical controls, both aspects there as well. 
The third aspect is detecting problems, right? Have a way of seeing when things go sideways or wrong. Um, and, and very, very quickly as well. So you have to have almost live monitoring being done in your environment to see what's going on on your network to see if, if, if things aren't working as, as those, uh, those controls aren't working as how they, you thought they were. And the last one is, is being able to respond to those incidents. And Catherine mentioned this as well about having you know, plans in place, uh, business continuity plans or incident response plans. Have a plan and a good one to make sure that you can put the fires out uh, and quickly when it comes to, to cyber uh, incidents. A lot of the ransomware issues that we have dealt with in the past, you know, completely shut down environments for a period of time. And you know, uh, organizations don't have an instant response plan and they are scrambling, trying to you know, put the team together and whatnot and some other things I'll talk about in a, in a little bit. Um, and that's not the time to, to do this. So some things that we need to balance when it comes to uh, protecting our information, uh, some information protection considerations. We can make things very, very secure, uh, bulletproof even. Your environment can detect attacks quickly and can automatically mitigate threats. This is ideal. This is, this is really what, what we want to go to. Um, and very functional. Uh, your protective controls are transparent and seamless, impacts are minimal, your workflows don't change, and there's no real burden on you know, your business or your clients. Step two, perfect. And obviously low cost. Our cyber investments are minimal and we're not breaking the bank. Here's the thing though, you only get to pick two of these, right? We can have, whoops, uh, we can have very functional at low cost. Uh, if you look for minimal impact at low cost, it's likely that the security controls implemented won't be as effective or robust. Uh, low cost and secure. Uh, while this works when considering protecting information, the, the overhead on your staff and clients will be considerable. Or we can have very secure and functional and building highly effective controls and making those transparent, uh, transparent is, is possible, but obviously, obviously costly. And you know, going back to the risks, that's what this whole conversation is about. What are the risks involved in, in a cyber attack? Uh, whoops. Um, obviously, your reputation. Catherine sort of mentioned that before, so I won't, won't dive deep into that, but a, a cyber attack in an organization can, can cripple one's reputation and very, very quickly. You know, we live in the days of, of, of Twitter where you know, information gets out and it's, it's, it's public knowledge very, very quickly if there is a cyber attack. Uh, clients, you may lose clients if, if you have a cyber attack and, and haven't dealt with that properly. Employees may leave as well if, if your employee information ha has been leaked or your employees information may be used uh, against them for identity theft and, and other purposes. And obviously there's a large financial hit. Um, you know, this costs a lot of money to mitigate these threats um, and, and even more money to, to deal with them at, at the end of the day. So, um, you know, it, it is a much better return on the investment to, to, put, to think about this from a proactive measure rather than dealing with it after the fact. So I'm gonna go over some things that you should be doing right now in your organization from a cybersecurity perspective, knowing full well that we, we've only got about five minutes left here. The first one is backing up your data regularly and securely. Um, you know, uh, this, is, this is very important because a lot of the ransomware threats that we see out there um, organizations can restore from, from backups and they don't need to pay that ransom. However, as I just mentioned earlier, you know, the new type of ransomware threats out there now is when the, the, uh, the threat actors are also stealing that data and, and threatening to go public with it if you don't pay the ransom. So that's a whole other, uh, you know, uh, threat vector that we, we need to think about. Consider an insider threat program. Many data breaches are due to insiders and organizations should develop a, a threat program that you can, and, you know, you can incorporate many aspects within a program like this from monitoring your employees, um, you know, to, to, to just having overall user awareness training for your employees. But, you know, so, sometimes, you know, you, the, the threat vectors from a insider threat um, are, not, are not on purpose. They are, they are accidental, right? So we need to put those controls in place to mitigate uh, the insider threat. Having a plan. Um, you know, the, this is no time to stick your head in the sand and pretend that everything will work out. Uh, organizations need to have a cybersecurity plan of action, uh, which not only includes a review of your policies and procedures, as Catherine mentioned, mapping to various frameworks, but also a plan to respond. 
Uh, we still deal with a lot of organizations that call us that are dealing with a live cyber breach that haven't, they don't have any plan at all. And they are scrambling at the last minute trying to put a plan together and, and deal with this. Testing your environment. Um, you know, have a vulnerability assessment conducted on your environment to determine if there are any gaps that need to be filled. And these can often be conducted you know, twice a year or, or once a year or during times of technology changes. It's important to know when, when you're making uh, changes in your environment if those changes are going to result in any security holes in your environment that we can, uh, we can help fix. Training your staff, as I mentioned earlier, uh, with the Insider Threat Program. Uh, focus your user awareness training on teaching your employees uh, the skills that they need to protect you know, not only your environment, but we've also found that teaching them some of the skills to protect their, their family or their home uh, is very relevant as, all, as well. A lot of times in the past when we've done user awareness training and we, and we walk in and we're just talking about um, you know, teaching the employees about protecting the environment, a lot of times we've heard, well, that's not my role. Right? That is IT's role to protect the environment or to protect the, to protect the organization. It's not mine. So we've pivoted over the years and we teach people skills to protect their family and their homes. A lot of those skills are transferable into the workplace. And by doing that, we've seen a dramatic shift in, in, in the, uh, the overall culture of an environment and, and, and creating a security con uh, culture, which has been amazing. Again, I've talked about having a plan and having a team. Uh, don't wait until an incident happens to start gathering a team. Have people ready to assist you. Um, this can be you know, your internal or external IT, HR, legal, you know, cybersecurity or incident response teams or any other you know, security investigators you might have in your organization. Develop a playbook uh, so that everybody knows uh, what to do when an incident occurs. And the last one is consider cyber coverage. Um, you know, many organizations, um, you know, can't afford, uh, you know, the, the, the costs involved when there is a cyber breach on the organization and cyber insurance can be uh, very beneficial in situations like that. It shouldn't though be treated as a catch-all uh, for, for everything and a lot of the controls I've just talked about or, or, or things that you should be implementing uh, still should be, be considered. I want to talk a little bit about, as Catherine mentioned as well, about what we are dealing with right now and some remote workforce considerations. Um, you know, with COVID-19, everybody is now working or a lot of people are now working from home and this may be the new norm for some time. Um, and there are a lot of considerations from a risk management perspective that organizations need to think about. Um, you know, I'm not going to go through each one of these. There's a lot of content on the slide, but we will be you know, giving you this, this presentation, I believe, and you can, you can read these. But there is, there is a lot of things to consider, not only from your, your technology, but your access management, your cloud environment, and, and how that's impacting, um, you know, your security, um, and, and various logging of, of, uh, of your activity as well from, from a uh, remote perspective. And the last thing I want to consider is just global considerations. Um, I was doing some, some research into various cybersecurity ar around the world, and I, and I came across this document, which is just from a, from a few days ago. And, um, you know, this is a draft law that I saw, um, which might be changed over time. Um, but what it is basically saying is that company with operations in China, um, you know, may... Uh, be required to disclose details about their network security operations outside of China um, as well. So, you know, we, we are seeing, um, you know, laws like this uh, being talked about in, in the industry from various countries, you know, enacting things to protect their, their national security and, and putting these regulations in place that not only affect the organizations in that country, but organizations that have operations outside of the country as well. So it's something to consider, um, you know, if you have operations in China and in Canada, you need to make sure that you might be having to, uh, to comply to, to various regulations as well. Okay, I think uh, I am done. So thank you very much, everybody. That was a lot of information to go through. And I think we can now open this up to questions and answers. All right, Catherine and Ryan, thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, insightful presentations. Um, uh, Catherine, I really liked um, 
uh, what you shared on risk tolerance, um, uh, which is finding a balance between growth and risk profile. We sometimes get so caught up in the opportunity, uh, say expanding into China or the Canadian market, that we need a reminder of how we manage the risk uh, that comes along with it uh, and how costly surprises can actually be. Uh, and Ryan, thank you for a reminder that cybersecurity is not a technical problem for the IT guys in the, uh, in the back room. Uh, it really is a business issue uh, that deserves their time. And after hearing the social engineering uh, discussion, knowing that most of us have a uh, WeChat or uh, Instagram account, uh, it really is an issue for all companies, not just the big corporates out there. Um, so just looking at uh, sort of the, um, uh, the questions that we may have out there, um, perhaps maybe I can start with one, maybe to Catherine. Um, so Catherine, many of our, um, uh, attendees here work for companies that uh, rely on making quick decisions to get an edge over its competitors, uh, especially uh, with the number of first-line individuals on this call. Um, like, how how do how do we um, how do you continue to stay nimble and not feel like our hands are tied uh, as you put these risk processes in place? Yeah, so I think, I mean, it's important for sure that that risk management not become the focus of everybody's day job. It really needs to be embedded in, in, in how people think and how they approach what they do. And so while there are functions that are focused in that space as a first line um, team member, it's really, you know, yeah. contributing to what that risk register looks like. So when we were talking about what is that risk profile of the organization and engaging with individuals across the organization to identify what those are, that really becomes the important part of then being able to help manage those and mitigate those. And so it becomes part of the behavior of the organization and not uh, an add-on where it feels like, you know, I'm, I'm here to do this job and on top of that, I now need to manage risk. It just becomes inherent in, in what somebody does. Um, so that's really part of how risk management needs to roll out in an organization and then periodically be refreshed by those risk management experts that you might have in the organization to say, here's where to focus, here's what's changed, here's where we're running okay, here's where we've actually put some effort that we don't need to anymore, um, and, and really just stay responsive in that way. Well, thanks, yeah, thanks for that. I think that's uh, really, really, really insightful. Um, and I think the key, the key part there is uh, not an additional uh, task that the person needs to do, but it really is sort of built into um, the, the overall process in terms of how decisions are made and, and so forth, uh, and, and, and eliminate those surprises. Um, that's fantastic. Um, um, perhaps a question to, to Ryan. Um, uh, as, as you're aware, uh, we're, we're at, at an economic time where many companies are trying to minimize overall spend. So what is your recommendation on how to, how to manage cybersecurity if you have a limited, limited budget? That's a great question. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I think the first thing that organizations need to do is just figure out what it is you need to protect. Um, and there are a, a variety of different controls that you can put in place. And, and I'll just name one, like two-factor authentication. Uh, which doesn't cost an organization a, a lot to do. It's, it's, it's fairly simple and you could be, you know, implementing two-factor authentication on all of your, you know, financial tools that you use on your email, on, on everything else. Um, so I think the, the, the misunderstanding, I think, in, in this realm is that a lot of people think that, you know, cybersecurity measures for an organization are very expensive to implement. And that, that's actually not, not the truth at all. Um, you know, there, there's a wide scale, obviously, of, of things uh, that, that, that can be done. Um, so, you know, I think it's understanding what data you need to protect. And then there are various levels of controls that you can be putting in place all the way through from, from, from simple, uh, you know, effective tools all the way through to, you know, live monitoring, daily monitoring and, and, and of your organization, which is obviously a, a little bit more expensive. Right. Oh, um, great. Thanks. Thanks for um, uh, that response. And I, I kind of leads lead me to um, uh, there's a question in terms of one of your slide, which is about choices. I really like that slide, actually. Um, and you mentioned that you can only choose two, um, a cost between cost, functionality, and security. Is, is there a real life uh, sort of example that, that, that you've seen where a uh, decision that's been made or a choice that's been made um, was considered not a good one? And, and, and what, how did that turn out? 
uh, a real life like security example of, of yeah security example yeah in terms of choices that's been made um but yeah, that's that's a great example. Um, well, I, I'd have to try to think of any any true examples at the top of my head. But you know, a lot of the the larger data breaches that have that have gone on out there, um, you know, organizations put cybersecurity controls in place, but they want things to be completely functional, and and the 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 controls weren't as effective as as you know was needed, and and uh, you know, threat actors were still able to get into their environment. Um, you know, or we do have organizations that say to us, you know, we want everything secure and we want it completely functional and that, that's amazing, but that's obviously, um, you know, very costly to do that. They, they wanted everything monitored every single day and, and great. We, we can absolutely do that for them. Um, but I, I can't think, I'd, I'd have to think of, of specific examples right now. Um, and I know I don't really want to name any names of, of things that went wrong, but, um, you know, there there are certainly various companies that have that have pushed those to one side or another, and and uh, has has affected either the operations or the security. Right. Okay. No thanks. Uh, thanks for that. Certainly, I, I think organizations need to make choices, uh, and in terms of kind of their their business objective, and that's that, that's certainly kind of a key point there. Uh, I just want to say, like to the to the audience, if you have any additional questions, feel free to uh, put in the uh, in the chat box. We we are running up to uh, sort of the end of the um, the, uh, the presentation, um, but if, um, but we we can certainly sort of follow up uh, on the responses uh, back to you uh, offline uh, if we um, if we need to do that. So perhaps one one last question to uh, sort of close up before I hand back to Jeff, uh, Catherine. Um, a question for you. Uh, for for certain companies that um, let's just say if they've just been sort of focusing on driving growth. Um, in the past little while, and haven't really thought much about uh, sort of risk um, um, governance and, and, and management and so forth. How, uh, how, do you, how, how do you suggest that they get started on the conversation? Who do they need to uh, pull to get on board? And like, what have you seen that has worked? So I think, uh, you know, it's a good question for lots of organizations because it's, it's a question of starting where you're at. And so, you know, risk topics uh, have been addressed. They just might not have been formally recognized. People do have an awareness of, of uh, what risks are out there. And so it's really collecting from what you've already got, what you already know, and building from there, not feeling like you have to have the Cadillac version of the risk management framework in place, but really starting with, you know, using uh, using specialists who are in that space, uh, engaging with people who know the business well, engaging with people within the organization who have a risk lens and saying, okay, if we start there, how do we build? And not necessarily trying to build right away for the, for the biggest and the best, but move to that um, as the organization can tolerate it. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, I know we're coming up to the hour, so thank you, uh, Catherine and Ryan, for your presentation and, and your responses. Uh, maybe I'll pass it off to Jeff uh, for now. Thank you so much, Ryan, Catherine, Grant, for uh, such valuable insights on risk management in global operations. A CCBC is an organization whose mission is to help ensure that more and better business happens between Canada and China. We are very proud to have ISM as a CCBC member, helping other members in their global operations. Again, thank you so much, ISM. And thank you everyone for participating in today's event. Bye now and have a great day.